So let's get started. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next insta uh, installation for the Goose webinar series. Uh, this time we have Group Captain Joe Brick from the Australian Defense College uh, talking about games for professional military education. Uh, Captain Joe Burke. Uh, Captain Joe Burke is the Chief of Staff of the Australian Defence College. She is an Air Force legal officer with extensive experience as a legal advisor to commanders, from the tactical to the strategic levels of the Australian Defence Force. Uh, with that, I hand it over to you, uh, Captain Burke, and you can start. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. Um, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gents out there in Zoom land. Um, for uh, joining uh, me and um, the George Washington um, University um, series, particularly to those of you who are, it's a rude time in the morning. So I think there was someone in Norway, we're at zero one. Thank you very much, that is amazing. So um, I will definitely try and make it your worth your while. Um, for everyone else in the United States, I hope you settled in with a beer and um, other drink of choice. I have a, a cup of tea in my Krulak mug, which I'm totally stoked about, but we'll get to the Krulak bit a bit later. Um, part of the uh, what I'm talking about this morning is um, how the Australian Defence College has incorporated um, games into professional military education. We are very much at the start of our journey. Um, and so I guess some of this might be new to some of the uh, veterans um, out there who have done this a lot in their uh, educational institutions. But like I said, we are very much at the start and, and engaging with um, people uh, like yourselves is really part of how we will uh, learn from all of your experiences and um, hopefully um, at some point in the future, we'll be able to um, interact um, and play games in, um, in physical proximity to each other at some point. So um, a little bit about myself. Thank you, Sebastian, for the intro. Um, I am a, uh, a legal officer, um, but my son says, oh, you're an OG gamer, mum. You're, uh, you're a bit old. Um, and so he's obviously a video game enthusiast like most young people these days, but I started with paper and, um, and pen. Uh, and this, these are some of the games that I started with. So um, the reason I put that up there um, is partially to advertise that I'm a massive nerd and I'm incredibly proud of that, but also um, to show you a bias that I have towards board gaming um, because I like the personal interaction that comes with that. Um, and I have played a lot of video games as well, but this is really a bit of nostalgia for me to show you <laughs> what I've played. And hopefully I'm sure there are people out there who have doubled in some of these, at least Dungeons and Dragons. And yes, I started with Monopoly, um, which is a sidebar apparently is a game about the futility of capitalism, um, which is really interesting given that it is the most boring game ever. Okay, so um, moving on, that's me. Uh, so just view that from my presentation from the lens that I am one of those people really pushing for incorporating games into PME because I believe it has a lot to offer. But before we launch into what ADC is doing, I'll tell you a little bit about the institution so we can situate um, what I'm going to talk about. So firstly, um, the Australian Defence College uh, consists of three primary um, residential um, training centres or colleges. Um, starting from the top there on your right hand side is the ADF Training Centre. Um, that's where we have our uh, international um, training centre for people coming to Australia to conduct um, courses. They do a lot of um, cultural immersion and also English language training, as well as academic preparation. Um, the training centre also has the Defence Force School of Languages, where we teach um, ADF members um, languages other than English. And also the other primary arm of that training centre um, is the Peace Operations Training Centre, which um, is a UN endorsed um, institution for conducting UN uh, courses and certification. And then there's the ADF Warfare Training Centre where we do our joint operations um, training uh, courses uh, like joint operations planning, um, joint fires course, information operations courses uh, and the like to prepare people for joint operations um, and working in joint environment. Uh, the, the school at the, sorry, the college in the middle there, the War College, um, is the one that I'm most familiar with. Uh, I was a directing staff there uh, two years ago at the Australian Command and Staff course, which is one of the courses run by the War College. The second major course it runs is Defence and Strategic Studies course. So the difference between those two is its focus. Um, the uh, Command and Staff course is at the 0405 level. 
um, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, has um, uh, parity institutions around the world. And the Defence and Strategic Studies course is our higher defence college, where we educate uh, 06s and above um, in preparing them for the governance of the um, Defence Department, um, a service, and really at that national level uh, of security. And finally, at the bottom is the Australian Defence Force Academy, which is our ab initio training institution. Um, it's generally a three year course, uh, unless people do honours year, um, and it's partnered with um, the University of New South Wales. And as a side note, we do have significant partnerships across um, the tertiary sector. So um, ADFA, uh, Australian Defence Force Academy, so you hear me say ADFA, that's the acronym for that, um, is partnered with the University of New South Wales. And the Australian War College um, has two partner institutions, the Australian National University and Deakin University. Um, the War College is in the process of finalising uh, its negotiations um, with a new uh, contractor, um, and that will be announced um, in due course in the next month or so. So it's an exciting time for the War College, uh, an opportunity to revisit the way it conducts business. And um, for me, it's an opportunity to incorporate a bit more war gaming into the War College. So uh, it's a good opportunity from that perspective. We also have a couple of centres of excellence. Um, listed there in the left uh, left hand box. Uh, the Centre for Defence Leadership and Ethics is pretty self explanatory. It's focused very much on those um, key aspects of uh, professional military education. It also has a nascent uh, cultural capability cell um, being set up at the moment to talk about cross cultural um, understanding and education. Uh, the Centre for Defence Research is um, our uh, publishers, our um, uh, Australian uh, Journal for Defence and Strategic. Um, security study, sorry. And um, the other one is um, a lot of our profession of arms series, um, which we run uh, seminars that are kind of run twice a year on a dedicated topic. Uh, the next one we're having is on civil military on the 30th of June. And then um, defense education, learning and training and the director of joint professional military education are really some of the powerhouses behind the curricula across all the institutions. Um, they make sure we adhere to um, defence's systems approach to defence learning. So that's a framework we have for all our curricula and learning objectives. Um, and that's really, uh, if you want to put, incorporate something into the formal parts of our courses, um, those two parts of ADC are really where we need to talk, um, talk to. So um, it's an exciting time, as I said, um, we're looking at wargaming or using games across the entire um, college. I think there's opportunities across all of them. And I'll talk about uh, some of those initiatives in a sec. And I just wanted to show you this. This is our, um, the Australian Joint Professional Military Education uh, Continuum. Um, it is, it sort of shows you where ADC sits. So ADC is very much a joint um, and integrated uh, educational and training institution uh, for all of the Department of Defence and also interagency. We do have interagency students on our courses, um, but it sits, um, it's intended to nest within the single service, so Navy, Army, Air Force, um, and public service uh, approaches to education. So you'll see um, uh, that Red Square says services led, supported by ADC, so that's the start. Um, of a person's journey through their military career. A lot of that is single service. And by about 04, 05, um, they get into the ADC led joint courses. Um, and on the left hand side of the diagram there, you've got the core areas of study that we focus on. So our courses uh, are across that, um, that spectrum. And the reason I show you this is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as I, I will highlight later, uh, obviously, the, um, the way we use games and the types of games we choose are very much driven by um, the level at which it's pointed towards and the learning objectives. Because obviously, as you move towards the right hand side from the tactical to the strategic, um, the types of decisions that need to be made by people and their experiential uh, learning requirements are going to uh, change quite a fair bit. So that's when when I talk about the JPME continuum, that's this is what I'm talking about. It's sort of the backbone of um, how we build our courses as well. <clears throat> so first question, why bother even using it? Um, I came across a, a quote in the course of my uh, research by Sid Meier, who I'm sure many of you are aware who he is. 
um, developer of uh, one of my favorite games, Civilization series. Um, and he said that a game is an interesting series of decisions. So as I said before, when we look at the JPME continuum, we, we um, want to attune our games to the audience that's in, uh, in those courses. And as those people develop and become more senior in their military um, or public service careers, they will make very different types of decisions with, um, uh, I guess, increasing uh, degrees of impact uh, as, as they move up in their ranks. So it really is a, a game provides an opportunity for those people to practice um, not just the making of decisions, but more importantly, um, the considerations they put into it um, in a simulated or modeled environment. So it's a safe space. Uh, games are a safe space to practice decision making. And so that's its real appeal to us um, from a PME perspective. And I'll just link it to what the General um, Commander of Australian Defence College, Major General McRon, who I'm sure you uh, is known to many of you, um, talks about developing this intellectual edge. Uh, essentially, you know, military capability, we tend to focus on, on a lot because it is <clears throat> a physical thing. We can see it, we can understand, we can understand and see what a JSF is and the um, physical manifestations of that. But behind all those um, amazing technical, logical uh, marvels are humans. And uh, education is obviously pointed at developing those people behind the machines. And um, intellectual edge is really that getting that extra, extra advantage over the adversary um, who's focused only on capability without the professional and technical mastery that uh, underpins it. So essentially bringing those two ideas together, um, using games as a means of developing that um, intellectual edge uh, from an experiential uh, perspective and complementing the formal modes of PME that are currently um, in our formal curricula at ADC. The other thing I just wanted to point out is um, Sid Meier in uh, that presentation, it was to the Game Developers Conference uh, in 2012, and it's online if you want to Google it and watch. It's about an hour presentation, really interesting. Um, he talks about games for interesting decisions and some uh, characteristics he points out here, excuse me a sec, <coughs> uh, which he, he thinks interesting decisions require situational models, um, putting a person into a context and seeing how they operate. Uh, personal, which is allowing a person to express uh, how would they would like to behave or some of their beliefs or um, uh, how they play the game. Um, I like the persistence part because not all games have persistence, um, but persistence is one of those things that um, we'll talk about in relation to a couple of games later, that uh, making a decision early in the game will have an impact on how um, it uh, impacts your gameplay towards the end. Obviously, risk reward, that's kind of a key part of decision making in any event. And then an interesting game would be one that has multiple goals or forces players to have multiple goals over short, medium and long term. Obviously, it depends on the game that you're playing. And something like Go, that's why I picked the picture, uh, has a lot of those um, characteristics in there. So getting to the nuts and bolts of joining uh, why games are important for PME, for us, um, it really is uh, those four points there, um, and they should be probably familiar to most of you is, uh, or all of you, is for me, it's about ways of thinking. So it's not so much about the games are fun, you know, as I said, I'm a gamer, I love playing games, but um, out of that uh, is looking at how you now think about some of the complexity and problems that are in front of you. Because I guess games are a model for problems to be solved um, with limited resources and constraints imposed by the rules. How are you going to achieve your goal uh, in that context? Um, also, the second part, planning well in contests. Um, as we all know, we've all been in those excruciating planning meetings where the plan looks absolutely amazing and everyone thinks it's great. Um, but when it's really in contest is the true test of your plan. Um, and as a side note, there's a fantastic, very short game that um, my son and my husband and I play called Flux, which I love, uh, where the, the rules are on the card and your end states will always change because the rules will change all the time. Um, and I really like that because it keeps you on your toes. It's a very simple game, but um, it's one of those dynamic ones where usually I think I'm winning, but um, something will change and uh, I'm just not prepared for it. And that's a game to teach you to be quite humble. 
Um, and, uh, and the collaborative nature of games is obviously one that models uh, a lot of, you know, the way we behave military and um, government uh, organisations of working with others. Um, and quite frankly, obviously, the games allow us to test plans and capabilities um, in a very safe environment um, where we are, where failure is actually encouraged because that tests uh, the concepts uh, and plans that we have. Uh, the other thing I really like about using games is abstraction. Um, you've been in those planning meetings or discussions where it gets down into the details of, for example, at JSF, and someone says, well, JSF can't do that, so that's just a stupid move in that game, um, to avoid all the angst, because there are very educated professional masters in particular capabilities. I mean, there's a time and place for those kinds of games. Um, but abstraction removes a lot of that angst. Um, and so on the picture there, I picked pandemic as a great one um, as abstraction for, you know, logistics of, of uh, trying to deal with a pandemic. It's very topical. Um, we played that a lot when we were locked down last year. It was just, I guess, a bit of dark humour in the family. But um, And the other one uh, is up there is Twilight Struggle and obviously um, Volko Rinky's um, Labyrinth at the bottom. So those... Um, present uh, interesting models of the Cold War for the Twilight Struggle, um, and also how to deal with uh, insurgency in, uh, in Labyrinth in um, the War Against Terror. So they're fantastic models just to hold some uh, dynamic variables in place so you can test out other things. Um, and so for us, I guess it's all about taking some of those small steps uh, in the PME environment um, to try and look at some of uh, places where we can incorporate uh, these games. And uh, I mean, the traditional model of learning, sitting in lectures and seminars, you know, great um, to listen to people as you lovely people are doing this morning with me. Um, but uh, it'd be nicer, wouldn't it, if we could all play games together, that would be an awesome way of, uh, of learning about each other um, and also learning together. So learning through play is something that seems to stop when you, um, when you become an adult. Um, you watch the way kids learn and it is seriously through play and they get through a lot of, uh, they learn a lot just from testing different things in a safe environment. Um, and I would encourage if any of you uh, have not yet read uh, a great book by Simon Parkin called A Game of Birds and Wolves. Um, it is an excellent um, story of uh, a guy called Captain uh, Gilbert Roberts from the Royal Navy who led a small team of uh, women's Royal Naval Service, and they used to call them the Wrens, um, at the Western Approaches Tactical Unit. They basically studied um, German U-boat tactics uh, and the wolf pack tactics uh, in the Atlantic because obviously a lot of shipping being lost in that, um, in that battle. Um, and they learned them over time and how to counter them. Uh, and interesting that these young ladies ended up um, teaching these hardened uh, Navy captains how to um, use certain tactics when they're uh, inside the, doing a convoy escort or doing patrols in the Atlantic um, against a German U-boat. So they used to run week-long courses, but that story um, is not very well known, um, and I encourage you to, to, to read it because... Um, they did encounter the same things that we're encountering at the college. Like, why would you bother using using games? That's sort of like child's play. That's not that's not serious learning. Um, and people think it's uh, a bit of an indulgence to use, you know, Commonwealth resources to play games. It's like, well, we're actually learning uh, when we play. So, um, I guess it's a, a good segue to some of the, the obstacles. I don't have a specific slide, but um, it, there's a lot of that cynicism of the utility of games and that it's not serious learning, so therefore why invest in it? Um, and also uh, it's just a, a lack of familiarity um, for what games bring. So we're at that part of the journey of convincing even people here at ADC the utility of games and in the Defence Department even more so. Um, it would be nice to uh, just be able to say, yeah, we're running a game and people go, yes, I understand, that's normal part of business. But um, I think we'll get there. Uh, but it is very much a little bit of a struggle of um, people thinking we're just sitting around in a room rolling 20-sided dice, and that's great because we do that, but it's for a, a, an end state that um, furthers how we do education through an experiential model. Uh, at the moment, um, we'll get into some of the things we're trying. Uh, this year, 
Um, the college uh, is very blessed to have three officers, um, and I'll name them and shame them because I don't know if some of them are here, but uh, uh, one of them is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Jenkinson. Um, there's also uh, Mark Mankowski and Phil Baldoni. So Mark and Phil are directing staff at the Australian Command and Staff course, and um, Scott uh, works with me in the headquarters. And these three gentlemen, um, I basically told them, give them some cash, try new things. Um, and that's exactly what they have done, um, which is trying to look at where we can incorporate some of these games to enhance the modules that are currently on Command and Staff course. Um, and at the moment, it really is, uh, the guys are just doing trial and error in their syndicates, which is great because the DS have a bit of latitude in what they can, uh, the methods they utilize in syndicate. Um, and also they run, um, I guess dedicated if people want to come um, afternoons in the in the mess here, where they run through these games. So Plan 1919 is, um, I guess, is a model for what would happen if JFC Fuller's uh, concepts uh, about um, combined arms on the Western Front were able to occur in 1919 if the war didn't end. Um, so that's that's they're using they did use that game just to look at some of those tactics and procedures and the way those. Um, battles were fought on the Western Front as part of the Operations One module, uh, as part of the World War One study. And uh, Mrs. Thatcher's War, which is the bottom screen, that's the uh, online version, um, was one they looked at for the Falklands and how that planning, uh, how you would plan and conduct that particular uh, insertion and operation. Um, and Scott was looking at uh, Fire in the Lake for the Vietnam War. So. Uh, a couple of students, we only have a small number of people turning up for these, but it's um, it's a great way to enhance um, some of the things I've learned. Uh, it sort of has a quick peek. Unfortunately, I didn't have, I don't have enough time as a chief of staff to hang out at a course. I might just tell the general I'm hanging out at a course one day. Um, but uh, from what I saw is a lot of students um, trying to link what they've learned um, on the formal parts of the course with the actual interaction and how they're going to play the different parties in this in this conflict, which is the real value uh, of the use of games. It's just another way, instead of just reading about what, um, you know, Ludendorff did or uh, what the British forces were playing on the Western Front, how about you play one of those sides and see how you go and um, take part in that model. So that's some of the things that are being attempted at the Command and Staff course. Um, and I'll just point out on the DSSC, so the 06 and above course, um, there is a, they have been using um, a uh, online game called Potentium. Um, I don't have enough details really to talk about it in an educated way. I'll just tell you the, the wave tops that it is um, intended to look at um, how influence affects um, decision-making at the uh, national level. So it's very much information operations, influence operations focused. Um, and I haven't had the opportunity to have a look at that game, but it, um, it seems to be working quite well over there. Um, and uh, it's a really important one um, in the current environment of uh, information and influence being, you know, key lines of effort uh, today. The other thing that um, uh, the guys are trying, uh, so a bit of background, uh, the Perry Group um, is one that General Ryan instituted in about 2018. Um, and it's a group voluntary. The students um, have to volunteer to be part of it. Uh, and it's about 30 students, um, uses uh, science fiction to look at future challenges and force design. So uh, they do have sponsors in Defence Department who ask the staff college students to look at certain um, problem sets. Um, and some of the topics that are um, up for grabs this year are listed there. Um, so the officer in charge of that, um, the Perry group this year is Mark Minkowski and he's trying a couple of uh, ways to incorporate games, primarily um, things like um, matrix games, pre-mortem uh, and cards. Cards essentially to uh, look at how plans stand up against random events. Um, and even the use of existing games, I think they're looking at that for the um, amphibious, AI enabled amphibious force concept. Um, something like Assassin's Mace, which is what the US Marine Corps um, have, which we looked at last week, um, which was, looks awesome and we need to get a bit more of that uh, into the college. So um, Colonel Tim Barris gave us a good demo on that last week. So really keen to pursue that a bit further, but that's another avenue for where we're looking at uh, incorporating games into some of the college's um, more formal parts of the course. And then um, 
the a, a Australian Defence College itself has a wargaming simulation centre. Um, it is uh, only a very small uh, group of um, people down, uh, sorry, up at um, Williamstown, uh, an Air Force base up north from Canberra. Um, and they have some amazing kits where they build a lot of uh, games and simulations that we use in uh, existing courses. So um, there's some of the, I've listed some of the capabilities there that they have. Um, what I have observed um, is, for example, they have a simulation um, that they use on UN peacekeeping. I think the plan students on US, UN peacekeeping preparation courses where um, students will, because they've got steering wheels and all the usual gaming controls, can drive a UN four wheel drive through a town, for example. Um, and they get the opportunity to interact with some of the locals who may be, for example, agitated at UN presence or, um, or practice how they would interact with the, the local community. Um, the other one that uh, we have, and I don't have listed there that I've seen, um, is at the Defence Force School of Languages. Um, they've got some motion capture gear um, and also someone dressed in a motion capture rig. Um, one of the language instructors um, in another room and the students are in another room interacting with the screen um, as they practice their language. Uh, the beauty of it is um, you can transform a diminutive um, lady uh, instructor who's teaching Mandarin into a very tall and imposing um, male figure on the screen for the students to interact with. Um, and as you know, uh, language language and the way that you use it will differ with the person, with their age or their gender. Um, so it allows the students to really uh, test out their language uh, skills in a, in a safe environment there. Um, otherwise, we'd be trying to find those actors with physical characteristics, whereas we can simulate it uh, in the language context. So that's some of the beginnings of, uh, of what we're doing, doing there. So as we move forward, I was sort of thinking some of the guiding principles um, for wargaming. So uh, we have to be careful, and me in particular, being a game nerd, um, of just going for games that I personally know and love. But it really should be driven by, um, like I said, the systems approach to defence learning, the framework that we have, um, and using um, games that are useful to achieve those learning objectives. Um, and, and maximizing the use of uh, abstraction where possible. Um, so that will allow students to really interact with the course material in a different way. Rather than a seminar, traditional discussion, uh, they can actually play some of the roles that are in history and, and test out why, for example, in a game called Battle of Britain, it's really hard to win as the Germans. Um, or maybe just I'm terrible at playing the Germans. Maybe the Luftwaffe is not my thing, but I just seem to get defeated every time. But it, it is a difficult um, uh, situation for the opposing forces where the, Brit where the UK and Britain had a, an advantage, for example, uh, in that kind of context. But understanding it through play, I think, um, solidifies the understanding a little bit better of the, of the course material. Um, and also, I think a big one uh, that um, Scott Jenkinson and I have talked about a lot, because Scott has uh, amazing experience from Canadian Forces College that he's brought to AEC, we're, so we're trying to leverage a lot of um, what's in Scott's head um, in relation to using reflection and discussion. I think that is a key part, really, um, of using games to situate the experience back into the course, the formal courseware, and to really allow the students to consolidate uh, their experience. So instead of just playing the game and walking away, there needs to be really some time built in um, as part of that. And the other thing is uh, accessibility. Not everyone is a nerd gamer like me that play games from when they were you know, eight years old, um, but it should be an environment where uh, people who want to learn are welcome. So um, I'm sure you've been in some of those you know, shops where people play games and you sort of walk in and uh, it's like, this is not a welcoming environment. Um, it's not something we, in an educational institution, we should be encouraging a welcoming environment where people um, who are experienced can learn. Um, and another principle I thought of just this morning driving to work, and I didn't put it in the slide, um, is uh, the need to grow and nurture very skilled facilitators. Um, some of the games, you're not going to play through them holistically. For example, Twilight Struggle can take up to two to three hours if you're really immersed in it just don't have the time to play the entire game. 
but um, a skilled facilitator can take a scenario um, from that game, let the students play it for a limited time, um, and then extract some of the good learning out of it. So um, we only really have uh, very few, like a handful of people who can probably do facilitating at ADC. Um, we could probably borrow another couple over at um, the Defence Department. Um, but uh, for the purposes of PME, I think ADC needs to grow those people who are skilled at using um, games as a method for formal facilitation of the seminars we already run. So that's something we need to uh, look at to make sure that the way we include games uh, is actually effective and useful. So what are the next steps? Um, uh, there's a couple of things we need to really look at. So firstly, the formal uh, incorporation of games needs a bit of time. I think uh, we probably need a 12 month trial period to look at, um, particularly as we're onboarding whether the new contractor is going to be at the War College. Um, looking at how we could possibly look at uh, incorporating games into the formal structures of um, both Australian Command and Staff course and the Defence and Strategic Studies course. Uh, and that will probably need to be a, um, there's a couple of options for doing that. And I think that needs to be a formal study of how we, how we do it through the curriculum team um, and also the uh, Joint Professional Military Education um, Directorate, as well as the, uh, some of the other course developers and, and the directing staff as well. So there's a bit of lead time to get that into the formal uh, curricula, just to make sure it's, I, I guess, done properly. But um, trial and error over 12 months is probably uh, one, one way to do it. Uh, as I mentioned before, we need to create some informal um, structures, and that's really, to me, creating something like a, a wargaming society at ADC um, that will allow us to um, get the more experienced gamers showing, um, showing off some of the games, uh, so they can possibly be also future facilitators, but also um, connecting beginners um, with, with gaming in a safe in, and welcoming uh, environment. And that's not just for ADC. I think that should be something that we can look at uh, across all of the uh, Department of Defence in Australia to start with, uh, and then connecting out to our uh, international partners like um, some people on this uh, call at the moment. It'd be great to work with you at some future time. Um, and that's really that networks I'm talking about in Australia. Um, Patterns, Allies, um, Academy and Industry. Um, and I know that some tertiary institutions use games, for example, in their political science um, departments. I mean, it could be as simple as the, the UN moot um, or the moots that uh, they do at law school uh, of putting yourself uh, as a member of the Security Council and negotiating something. I mean, that's, that's you know, an RPG. Um, you don't tell people that they're playing something like Dungeons and Dragons because they get a bit, you know, antsy about that. But, uh, that, that, well, they could, but that's essentially what they're doing. Uh, and the last thing is, um, I was very fortunate uh, only recently to have been uh, appointed as a non-resident fellow at the um, United States Marine Corps Crew Relax Center, for which I'm absolutely stoked and grateful. Um, and it is an opportunity to really work with the United States Marine Corps um, as a partner in this because their extensive experience and um, the planning guidance that their general, their commanding general has given them to enhance and look at wargaming is fantastic. And I think we have a lot to learn um, through uh, that fellowship and uh, something as simple as um, Colonel Tim Barris look, uh, showing us Assassin's Mace the other day, which is an amazing game, um, is probably a starting point and something we can uh, continue. So it's a two-year fellowship. Uh, my intention is to really leverage that um, to drive this forward for the, for the college. Um, so that's really the end of the formal part about ADC. Um, the second part of the presentation, um, which I'm going to go over uh, reasonably quick, is just something I'm thinking about um, in relation to how we use games. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, wargaming for education and that sort of stuff, but I think there's a real ability to look at games um, and use it as a way of uh, building an empathetic approach to planning and uh, decision making, particularly in, in the national security environment. Um, so uh, the pictures I've picked there are, are deliberate. Um, just as a bit of background, I, I really got interested in, in empathetic approaches because as an Air Force officer, I spend a lot of time uh, in my military role uh, in a combined air operations center, looking at screens all day. Everything looks gray or kind of full motion video can be colored obviously, but from a different um, perspective, usually above. Um, and it kind of makes it a little bit more uh, 
you know, sanitary, but it really isn't. War is not a sanitary endeavor. It's messy and ugly. And I think as military professionals, we need to understand that, um, understand the consequences of our decision. And that's part of being a true uh, professional, I think. Um, so the pictures are, like I said, I always see the gray at the top there. That's really normal business as usual for me. But there is con there, the consequences are at the bottom there. You know, there are people on the ground um, who are affected by these military actions. And having a look at um, other people in the battle space, not just us and the adversary, I think is an important part to really understanding um, strategy, grand strategy, how we achieve our um, strategic end states, not just in the military side of the house. So, and games, I think, offer a really good avenue to that. So I'm going to quickly look at a game um, that... Uh, I don't know how many of you have played, but I have played but never finished. And uh, the reason will become evident very shortly. It's a game called This War of Mine, <clears throat> which is uh, looks at survivors um, in a in a war zone, uh, basically by the game designers uh, on Sarajevo. And um, because uh, the, the game designer, whose name escapes me, unfortunately, uh, is was a, someone from uh, of that background. So. Um, it is uh, quite a confronting game. It's a collaborative one, up to six players, and a lot of decisions you make obviously hinge on your survival. But um, one of the things that uh, one of the game design dynamics is, uh, as I've got there, there's um, a status or state token for each character, which looks at their fatigue, wounds, their level of misery, um, how hungry they are, and their illness. Um, and the game also is available on Steam um, with a number of expansions, including one focused on children called The Little Ones, which I will never play because that will just, I just think that would be a little bit way too confronting for me. Um, the main game enough uh, is enough for me. So um, quickly looking at this one, uh, obviously war games traditionally, you know, you and the adversary, very sanitary battle space. A um, couple of, if you have, you know, flames of war, you got some miniatures of houses, but never any other players other than yourself and the opposing party. Okay, so sanitary battle space. Um, so this looks at uh, war games from a different uh, perspective. So quite um, very briefly, uh, there's actions uh, available to the players that are determined by the time of day um, as listed there. And the gen they're the general things you would expect of survivors, right? They're trying to survive in this terrible uh, war zone. Um, and they need to find, uh, improve their shelter, look for food and medicine if, if it's available, prevent other survivors from taking their stuff or endangering them um, because night raids are a part of uh, this game dynamic. So uh, it just increases the tempo a little bit. Um, and then there's uh, also fate cards that determine, depending on your level of fatigue or your wounds, there are certain things that may happen to your, to your character. Um, if they can't, uh, you know, deal with the fact that someone in the party has died, for example, or is lost. Um, there's a couple of things that may happen to characters there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the other thing I really like uh, about this um, is the narrative part of it. Um, it is quite an immersive experience, which is why I've never finished it, because it can get quite, uh, quite deep and sad. Um, my husband and I got to, I don't know, we played probably an hour and a half one time and it's like, that's it, we're done. I don't want to go any further um, because it's just really quite a, um, a sad account of what it's like to survive. Um, and there's, there's a book of scripts um, where, uh, depending on the encounters you have, for example, up there, um, you can see the card says jam door um, and you have to make a couple of decisions uh, and depending on your decision will determine which narrative you read in the book of scripts. Um, the other dimension I like about it is there are moral and ethical decisions and player consequences that come out of it. And I'll show you uh, in the book of scripts where this, where this happens. Um, there's a couple of extracts. I took some photos of some of the uh, examples there, so hopefully you can read it. Um, but if you look at um, number 472, the script there, uh, where you come across a, uh, another survivor um, who looks famished and exhausted uh, and he's asking you for help and he's also got gunshot wounds. Um, now, you're a survivor some, and it's very hard to find food and very hard to find medicine. So you've got all that stuff on you, potentially, uh, and you come across someone like this and it becomes a discussion of, am I going to expend all this stuff on this person? Whereas if I have my 
my housemate, my friends in my survival shelter who are waiting, one of whom might be injured, how am I going to make this decision? And so it becomes a bit of a discussion with the players of, well, what are we going to do with this guy? Um, and there's two options there, as you can see. You can give the person some food um, or you can basically leave him there and just tell him, so hey, he's going to die anywhere. It's not my problem. Um, and you'd go back to your, to your game. So that's really some of the more, and that's one of the more benign scenarios, I have to say. There's some other more horrendous ones in the book um, that really look at some of the moral, ethical decisions that have to be made uh, in such challenging situations. So um, it can be used as a mechanism for looking at ethics and morals in war. Um, if you're running a course on that, um, for our Centre of Defence Leadership and Ethics, that's something they're developing a lot of courseware uh, on the ethics side of the house. Um, so, yeah, a game like this, um, you could facilitate a couple of scenarios because it is a long game as well, um, where you could uh, use it to discuss some of these moral ethical quandaries. Um, and for something a bit lighter, if you really want to go light, a very different type of game is um, Trial by Trolley, uh, which is a little bit more of a party game, I suppose, um, where you obviously have the trolley problem and two tracks and players get to put, um, you know, cards on the tracks. Um, and try and advocate for why their particular person needs to live as opposed to the other one, which gets into some bizarre conversations. But that's a little bit more of a lighter approach to uh, some ethical conundrums, in that case, using the trolley problem uh, mechanism. Uh, and so I've just got some quotes there because um, my, uh, my husband's a bit of a Kickstarter FOMO guy and uh, he um, bought this on Kickstarter. So we got a letter from the game developers um, yeah, there again, Carl Ockhaus and uh, Jacob Wiskaus, Wis, Wisnowski, um, who, you know, um, looked at the game, developed the game very deliberately to look at some of the human aspects of it. Um, and so uh, games, yes, can be fun, but they can also be used for social constructs. Uh, and this one I like particularly, but I don't play often um, because it is quite uh, emotionally, emotionally weighty. Um, the next game I'm going to talk about, which I'm sure some of you may have heard, but this one Scott Jenkinson told me about, uh, and uh, wow, this is one hell of a game. Okay, so Train um, is uh, was developed by uh, Brenda Romero, uh, formerly Braceweight, and so if you're looking on online, um, some of her material is under her other name, um, Brenda Braceweight, but she looks at games to look at social issues. Uh, and so there's one called the mechanic, uh, sorry, there's a series of six of them called mechanic is the message. Um, and this one we're looking at here is, is train. So it's quite old um, from April 2009. It's a bit of a mix between an art installation uh, and a game. Um, and so there are three people interacting um, who are, and the objective is to get as many people as possible to the terminus at the end of the track. Um, and you put those people onto the train. Um, and each person's worth 100,000 people. So um, there's a number of, uh, in, in a turn, there's cards and um, uh, dice rolling to move the train from the start point uh, to the terminus. So take a card, play a card, um, are some of the, the game. So it's very simple in that, in that, um, in that sense. So people can maximise uh, and get the efficiencies for trying to get to the terminus first with the most number of um, people on board. Now, um, the game was deliberately, so when you get to the, sorry, I went a slide too early, but uh, when you get to the terminus, um, there's a terminus card uh, that you have to take um, and the destinations. Um, so in the video, she basically says, take a terminus card and then person turns it over and it says Auschwitz. Um, and it turns out that all the terminus cards are uh, uh, named after uh, Nazi concentration camps. And so um, at this point, um, she says in the video that there are so many different player reactions to it, um, going from people crying and walking out, uh, anger, um, people then who are still playing, who haven't finished yet, changing the rules because they're like, all right, well, if the train's going there, it's actually, how do I make this? Um, not go to the terminus, essentially. Um, and it is designed to be incredibly confronting and as a way to um, <clears throat> talk about something very difficult. Uh, and now there's um, one thing she did talk about was this derail action card. 
where half the people will go back to the start and then others refuse to board. And the card is designed to be ambiguous um, to, to um, stimulate discussion about what to do next. Because then what do you do with the people? Um, the train's derailed, you can put some people back to start, others refuse to board, what are you gonna do? Um, and she said that some people would defer to the procedural rhetoric, uh, which is all the, the rules lawyers, right? Who, well, what do we, what do, we do? What do the rules say? Um, an interesting thing there is, if you want to know what the rules say, you've got to go to the typewriter, which is at the end of the table. The rules are inserted inside the typewriter. Um, and at that point, the people who are still playing and haven't reached the terminus will um, realise, some people, very cluey, will realise the two symbols there on the, above the number five, because what she's done is used a typewriter. Um, it's a genuine uh, Nazi SS typewriter that she has at the end of the table and she's put the rules in there. So at that point, some people clue onto it and go, All right, I don't want to play anymore or deliberately try to change the rules so that they can start saving some people. For example, the derail card, apparently someone said, okay, they get back on the train and they're going to Denmark. They're not going to the terminus um, because someone's figured out um, what this is all about. So, um, I like the quote she, she has there from an interview in Wall Street Journal. And like I said, there's a rich um, list of articles about this game because it's just so unusual and it's not ever going to be commercially made. It was really like an art installation, um, interactive one, um, where she talks about games being a good medium for approaching any subject, particularly different ones. Um, because I abstract and let us um, con confront it um, in a, a less, I guess, look at the issues in a less confrontational way. Uh, and this one was looking at the issue of complicity, because uh, at the start, um, you know, people don't generally know, unless you've looked at the installation quite closely, uh, apparently a lot of people figured out what this is all about and just absolutely flat out refused to play. Um, and there are others who are just intrigued by the game and don't know anything about it. So. Uh, it's quite an interesting one um, from that perspective. I would love to see this in, in real life. I'm not going to play it, but um, just to see the thought that's gone into it. I think she said it took her um, a year uh, to develop this game um, and look at it uh, to, as a way of looking at the, the Holocaust. Um, and the other thing, in my travels of looking at train, because that was a bit of a rabble hole went down, but thank you, Scott. I learned so much. Um, and when Scott first told me about this game, I'm like, oh, yeah, this could be awesome, you know, work placement, blah, blah, blah. And then he told me about the Terminus, and I had this moment of shock. Oh, how could you do this to me, Scott? Um, anyway, it was uh, like I've got the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. It's just one of those games. That's, that's the power of some of these immersive experiences. Um, and so in my travels, I learned about this thing called Games for Change, where, which looks at uh, digital, digital non-digital games to look at um, contemporary social issues. Interestingly, when I said to my son, hey, uh, Sean, he's 13, have you seen this? And he said, yeah, I know exactly what that is, mum, geez. Um, which is really heartening um, that young kids are looking at uh, games and gamification anyway to look at some of these social issues. I think that's the young, young folks seem to be uh, streets ahead um, of people like me. So um, that's something I'll just throw out there for interest if you want to look at some of those things as a mechanism for social issue discussion um, for education. And so that really brings me to the uh, end of, of the discussion there um, of uh, how ADC wants to look at uh, games and uh, some of the more interesting games I want to explore personally uh, in, ex in looking at ethics uh, conundrums and moral social issues um, because I guess it's a lesser known part of uh, how games can be used that we can possibly uh, look at in a bit more detail. Um, now it's the end of my for the formal part of my presentation but I'll just give a quick plug to the Forge which is the ADC uh, website where we have a wargaming series um, which we ran at the end of last year. A number of um, amazing uh, game designers um, we're very kind enough to donate their time and effort um, to write about it. We've got people like Jason Matthews and um, Anna Gupta and uh, Volker Arinke, uh, Ellie Bartels and a bunch of other amazing humans uh, and Sebastian, of course, uh, who wrote, that's where I first met Sebastian, um, online asking him to write an article. So thanks, mate, um, for the Wargaming series. Uh, and if anyone would like to, so please go and have a look at it. And if you want to contribute to the discussion, um, send me an email uh, and we can look at um, posting it as part of this uh, part of this series. So 
Um, that's really it from me. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me for 50 minutes, harp on. Um, it's a bit weird to present in Zoom, as you know. Um, so I'm open to any discussion and, uh, and questions. So handing over, Sebastian. Hey, perfect. So actually on this topic of the, uh, of the Forge and the Wargaming series, I would like to start off with that question first. Um, can you talk about some of the logic of why you guys started this series and what you guys hope to get out of this series? Uh, so the series was um, uh, intended to really start the discussion, really. Um, uh, and part of the researching for my uh, education is as to how games are used as a, in my role as the Chief of Staff. Um, Com ADC set out a directive um, to, to me to basically say, start looking at wargaming and how we can use it. And the series was really designed to be um, looking at how other people have done it before and um, and to start the, the conversation. So um, when I did really, the people in there are just people I sort of Twitter stalked or Google stalked, uh, including you, Sebastian, which <laughs> came up with that amazing uh, uh, your university um, pages, which uh, was fantastic. So, uh, and even people like Paxim as I found online. So like I said, it's really the start of our journey. Um, and for, for more experienced people, you might look at the series and go, yeah, it's a little bit, little bit basic, but um, that's sort of the foundation of, of our discussions in there. So that's how it started. So along that note, so what sort of inspired this move to incorporate and integrate educational gaming at ADC? I know you mentioned parts of it in your presentation, but could you go a little bit further into it? Uh, you mean like the actual origin story? Yep. Of it? Um, it's really quite quite simple. Um, uh, like through just discussions with other people here, because some of the academic staff are into gaming in their personal life of thinking, why, did you, why don't we use games? Um, and when you look at the rest of the, our partner institutions of allies and partners around the world, very strong wargaming departments, um, it seems just generally accepted as part of education and training that um, games and gamification is a normal part of business, but we don't tend to um, use it too much in Australia for, for whatever reason. We just don't have a tradition of it. And um, part of my drive to do it is uh, when I was at uh, directing staff at Command and Staff Force, um, looking at the wargaming phase of uh, cause of action development in the planning process, we kind of just skim over it because I don't think we have enough people who really understand how to run that part. And I think it's one of the more important parts of the planning process of pitting your plan against uh, you know simulated adversary. So um, it's, it just seemed underdone for us as a college. And so I think we were just missing, missing something to complement some of the other awesome work that the, the academic staff are doing. So it really is quite a simple, we're not doing it, we really should start looking at that. So on that note, someone asks, is Wargaming a component of mandatory learning at ADC or is it a Wargaming used to complement select modules and lessons or is it extracurricular activity right now? Um, so right now, yeah, it's really off the bat of those three officers I mentioned before, their efforts and endeavours um, in doing it uh, in their own syndicates. So there are about 13 guidance groups and syndicates roughly, uh, maybe 14 this year, of students. Um, and we have three of them who are dabbling in it. So it's still a small proportion and they're doing it of their own initiative. Um, and then there's um, the, it's very much informal. So when I say they play games in the mess, it was really very much informal of um, one of the directing staff sending out to all the students, hey, we're gonna look at this game. It's gonna look at, uh, for example, Plan 1919. It's relevant to our operations module. If you wanna come along, please do. Um, and that's essentially, uh, that's it. It's not mandatory uh, at all um, as part of the college at the moment. And I don't see it being, being mandatory um, I think something like a wargaming society should be something people want to do. Um, but in the formal parts of learning where they incorporate games, and that's obviously part of the formal courseware um, at some point. But uh, yeah, we're, we're still yet to get to that. So on that note, Zone uh, asks, have you guys considered using any of the student games that uh, Phil Saban at King's College London uh, posted or is designing a game ever a student project envision at ADC? I, um, this is the world according to Joe. I think it would be amazing to get to that uh, at some future evolution. At the moment, like it started the nascent journey. Um, it would be good to be able to uh, use those games um, at King's College 
and also to develop a game design sort of module or at least uh, part of the course here, any of the courses here at ADC, because that's really, that's how you grow your facilitators and your game designers. You can really build bespoke games for defense for Australia as well, because our obviously geostrategic circumstances are very different. Um, and so we have a different context. Say we can't really use hegemony, for example, in Australia in its full sense, because the considerations are just so different from what uh, Australia as a nation would look at um, in a simulated sense. We'd have to look at an Indo-PACOM part of that. Um, but uh, yeah, to answer the initial question, we are using it at the moment, but I think in the future, that is something that defense needs to look at uh, developing game designers uh, who can then uh, use that skill set across the defense portfolio, not just in education and training, but operation and strategic planning um, as part of like, for example, analytical wargaming. I know that DST has an analytical wargaming part and there's probably good game designers in there, but it's not a, um, I guess, recognized discipline. You have to go digging for these gay des game designers uh, in, in defense in Australia. So, so to piggyback on that question, um, what are the most prominent learning objectives for ADC in respect to wargaming, for instance? Is it strategic versus operational level of war? Or is that the tactical level? Or is it focused on uh, types of wars, such as your know, major power, uh, power wars or low uh, intensity conflicts? Sort of, I think this sort of harks back to that first slide you had about your JPME um, spectrum. Mm -hmm. Or is it historical games to inform case studies and principles of war or future war scenarios? I know that was a big, long question, but um, have a crack at it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, th I, I think I get what it's getting at. Um, look, uh, like I said, yeah, it is pretty much, um, as I mentioned at the start, um, there is a real danger of uh, just going down rabbit holes um, uh, to explore games that, that people personally like or invested in. But I think um, we need to link it always back to the JPME continuum. And it's really games for courses. So something like Hegemony um, or Twilight Struggle, you would be using that in sort of Australian Command and Staff course and the Defence and Strategic Studies course. So we're heading towards that strategic and grand strategic um, learning that they are doing in those courses. Um, TTPs and operational planning. So uh, that's why Plan 1919 was so good because it is at the operational level, um, something for Command and Staff. And then all the tactical um, war games uh, could be used in some of the ab initio training institutions like ADFA where you're trying to teach them the sort of the concepts of combined arms, um, combined arms, uh, you know, maneuver and all that kind of stuff that is part of the ab initio training as, as officers. Um, so it's, yeah, horses, horses for courses. I think there's room uh, across the spectrum to look at different types of games, but I think they need to be linked really to those um, learning objectives just to maximize their effectiveness um, and I guess that's the beauty of the wargaming societies it can be a bit of a um, experimental uh, area where you would get the people in that side just play a game think about where it would fit in uh, in the ADC sorry curriculum as a possible um, you know fit for a course um, but you really need to tailor the game you use for the learning outcomes I think to really make them effective. So, on, so to dive into that question a little bit more, do you have any particular courses that you think would be conducive or that you guys are aiming to incorporate more wargaming into, like whether it be a military history course or a strategic I mean, uh, operations course? Um, probably, uh, probably both and probably all the courses, I would, I would say. Um, so uh, we already, as I mentioned, have some gamification, like in our language school, for example, where the students... Um, uh, quite uh, taken by the simulation of using their language skills to interact with someone on, on the screen. Um, so that's, uh, you know, a safe space for them to test new things in the way that they use language. Um, and obviously in the UN uh, Peace Operations Training Centre has a, um, and the cross-cultural probably where you could fail safely in trying new things and in interactions with, with humans. Um, through a simulated environment or even a role-playing game if you're going to go through that um, approach. Um, and also, uh, I've been talking to the director of the Centre for Defence Leadership and Ethics who's um, looking at the use of games to look at ethical problems. Uh, and that's why, I guess, inspired me to look at those two games I highlighted at the end. 
um, because ethics in particular um, is interactive, right? Ethics is almost, uh, it's a practice, um, ethical behavior as a practice. So how do you um, practice ethical decision-making? You can't sort of, you can read all the theory you want, but you need to confront the students with a dilemma um, and get them to solve it in their own way and have a reflection at the end to look at, you know, the decision that they made. And so um, that's probably where a rich area there for us um, to look at that center for using uh, games. I don't know if it's used currently. Um, I don't think so. There is a lot of um, a lot of lectures that they deliver, but not really. Maybe a bit of um, classroom discussion and role play, but not, um, I guess, gamification in the sense that I discussed um, this morning. So on that note, um, a lot of your a lot of the games you discuss are about experiential learning uh, and learning through iterations and complementing course material already. So a couple of people have asked this in the chat about, um, have you guys been considering or have you considered using games? <laughs> That's my dog Winston, by the way. Uh, <laughs> have you guys been uh, you, uh, considering using games for uh, as an evaluation tool? Um, and would this impact the engagement that you have with ADC or is that something that is off the table for you guys? Um, well, I guess if you look at um, the operational operations planning module at the staff college, they're already using that sort of assessment model for uh, how they deliver their concept of operations at the end of the um, the module, because that's I guess there's a it's it's role playing really uh, where they uh, role play chief of staff delivering the plan to the commanding uh, commanding officer, um, and so there is a little bit of that role play approach. So it is modest. Um, for and that's an assessed one. Um, and across defense, there are also, um, I guess, a lot. It, it's in my experience, it has been role play. I've not seen um, assessment in another way of how you played a particular game, per se. Um, it could be, I think, on the cards. That's, I mean, everything's on the table at the moment. Um, if that's a method of assessment that, um, the cur curriculum managers and uh, are happy with as, a, as getting an outcome um, that's linked to the, the course outcomes. I think that could be an avenue for uh, for assessment, but we're just, yeah, we're really just not there yet, but I think we, we could evolve to that at, at some future um, point. So um, to, uh, to address some of the questions and uh, comments happening in the chat right now about uh, games for assessment, um, in terms of uh, as idea, I mean, this has happened for a long time, like during the 90s, the Marine Corps considered uh, games um, for evaluation. There was a series of Gazette articles about it. You can still look them up if you're interested. Um, but they both sides sort of give advantages and disadvantages both approaches. For example, if you do evaluation game, you can treat it like a social science, right? Where you can do a laboratory, you can actually test their practical application of whatever course material they use. Uh, Mitch Reed just recently um, who's a war gamer at headquarters Air Force just published something in Divergent op uh, Options about that kind of approach. Um, but at the same time, mm -hmm. they are downsides to this that in the sense that it runs the risk of gaming the game, right? Where you cheat the, 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 the yeah. system of the game where you, mm -hmm. you optimize for people who think in certain game mechanical ways, um, which may mm -hmm. or may not produce you the kind of results that you want. Um, but you know, yeah. I, I think uh, that notion of using games in education is very important, um, as you guys know. Uh, but we will proceed on with other questions. So, are there any recommendations for games that could encourage decision making that requires outside the box thinking for a team of engineers? I'm looking to expand my team system of systems approach to our core business of major acquisitions projects. Gaming might be a novel uh, approach. Could you rec do you have any recommendations on that? Well, I'm probably not the best person to ask on that. I think, Sebastian, you're probably the best person uh, to ask. So, uh, well, a system, looking at oh, yeah, all games are systems, I suppose. Um, and it, it, it's one of those things that whether you're looking at um, those outcomes in abstract, uh, whether you can get those learning outcomes in an abstract fashion, not necessarily an engineering game per se, but some other um, method or even off the shelf games that deliver you some of those systems approaches. Um, could be one. I don't know. Power Grid is one that comes to mind for whatever reason. I've only played that once. Um, but uh, I can't really recommend one off the top of my head. So I'm, I apologize profusely. Um, maybe Sebastian has encountered some. I'm not sure, mate. Have you? 
So actually, um, when I was reading this question, I was thinking about the game you mentioned, Flux. Uh, game, mm -hmm. So games are great for innovation, sort of outside of the box thinking when you force the games to be flexible and fluid, like Flux is, right? Where the game parameters themselves are by, them, by nature uh, changing, right? It forces people to avoid like you know, being on railroad tracks in terms of thinking so that you know I mean, it may not you know I mean, address a particular engineering question but if you just are trying to get a certain type of thinking of like making people think outside the box a little bit you know I mean, a game like flex or games that have uh flexible or fluid rules in transit uh, of the gameplay is something you may want to look at and of course other people on this you know I mean, chat slash webinar have their own recommendations um Moving on to the next question is, um, I'll combine a couple questions that ask about you know, I mean, the collaboration between the Australian MOD's uh, analytical wargaming efforts and your own efforts at ADC in terms of educational wargaming. So the first question would be, is there any collaboration or cross-pollination that you guys mentioned? Like last week we had uh, um, Peter um, from Dawn, right, uh, the Defense Analytical Wargaming Network from the uh, for, from the Australian MOD. Uh, is there any uh, coordination or cross pollination between your two organizations? I guess is the first question. Uh, not yet, um, but we are definitely uh, in touch. And in fact, um, uh, we sort of got connected at the start of the year um, through someone, uh, Todd Mason, who you might be familiar with through um, the Connections Oz. Uh, team, so he was at he's at DSTG as well, but um, not in a not in a formal sense yet. Um, we are, um, I guess, trying to uh, when we establish something here at ADC, they are definitely a key stakeholder. We could invite to even look at um, using analytical wargaming to test some of the planning concepts at the War College, um, or interacting with um, the Defence and Strategic Strategic Studies course when they're looking at concept development. Um, so. Uh, to answer the question directly, not not formally, but um, it's something we are already talking about. But it's just finding those those ways, and I think we're going to have to um, uh, look at maybe getting them over to uh, look at some of the courseware, maybe, uh, and and where we can incorporate some of those analytical gaming uh, approaches in in the way that we do uh, education here at the college. So um, going into external collaborations as a theme. So what are some other organizations you mentioned the Krulak Center and the Marine Corps University that you're sort of partnering with or hoping to partner with as you guys move forward with your initiative? Um, well, your guys, for sure, um, <laughs> Sebastian. Um, I'm interested in the, your, your war gaming society and, and I guess how that uh, est got established and, and getting people to come to the, the gaming table as it were. Um, because I think that's probably part of the challenge is uh, looking at some of those informal mechanisms is one I'm, I'm interested in as a, as a feeder for the more formal ways we do business. Um, so definitely uh, your crew. Um, we have connections with, um, with RAND here in, in Australia. Um, and so uh, looking at um, hegemony, I know that the um, strategy and policy uh, guys over at um, Russell offices in the headquarters are looking at using that game for the senior leaders. Um, and so, uh, and really, I guess the world is our oyster at, at ADC. Once we um, have a more definitive path uh, established for moving forward, we will, and particularly in COVID time, it's been hard to, I guess, some of those connections, um, but really start inviting people to Australia, some of them hopefully future, not too far away time. Um, and run some of these. One thing we are thinking of is running like a, a, a seminar here at ADC. Um, and that's mostly focused on internal first uh, to understand in defense who is doing gaming um, and understand what, they, what kind of gaming they're doing for what purpose. And then we can move to the external partnerships and looking at maximizing uh, some of those. And I know in, in defense, there's people connected already to the uh, Navy postgraduate school and the work um, that Jeff's doing out there um, and even to King's College London. Um, so they, they're some of the places we would look at, but definitely, um, you know, the, the people, uh, the existing partnerships we have in the alliances and partners in NATO, uh, really ones we would look at first and um, look at some of them, look at some of those institutions as, uh, as models that we could um, 
uh, replicate if, if it's relevant to uh, to us because we are a small defense force um, not many not many people in the ADF and so uh, even like I'm just in awe of the United States Marine Corps wargaming lab and all the things they have there in the wargaming division that's just fantastic but we could just never reach that level of, of scale so we have to be a little bit more modest in our, in our approach to so that's just a you know resources issue for us which only tells you about relative size because you're in the Marine Corps in terms of budget and resources, like the smallest of the bunch. Um, mm -hmm. But it's all about where you sit, right? Uh, so yeah. in terms of um, yeah. next question, someone uh, particularly brought up the UK Fight Club, which is a wargaming initiative mm -hmm. um, in terms of education training uh, in the British Army. Have you guys been working with them or looking at them as a model? Uh, we haven't, but there is uh, the AF wargaming um, group that's... Uh, um, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Hill uh, is sort of the OIC of, um, and I think he has connections with the US Fight Club. So in the uh, Australian Army, there are um, war gaming is not not as new to them. They've been sort of working um, that through um, their Duntroon, their initial officer training, through to even just uh, the brigades and the units. Um, so they, I think Dave Hill has a connection to UK Fight Club. But that's something we, again we would look at. But I know that uh, I think the US, uh, sorry, the Australian Army is already connected with them um, at the to look at sort of the tactical um, war gaming um, options that some of those things that they they offer. So in terms of looking forward, what is some of the you know, concrete goals you guys have for yourselves and your war gaming initiative for this coming year in terms of you know, uh, moving the ball forward? Okay, so uh, interesting you asked that question. Um, there is currently a, a brief I've got in front of the general uh, for him to approve some of the concepts to, to drive this um, forward. Um, for me, one of the most important ones I think that we need to unpick uh, at ADC is the creation of a bespoke position that focuses on uh, wargaming. Because um, it can't be me as the chief staff. I've got you know sixty million other things to do. <laughs> I'm doing this because I love it. But I think there needs to be a dedicated officer. Um, within uh, perhaps the director of joint professional military education who focuses on um, war gaming for education as a as a method um, and then can make those links formally into the curriculum parts of, of the college um, but I think that's the biggest challenge we face at the moment is the, the there is no dedicated person um, to drive these initiatives forward because as I mentioned before there are three very energetic officers but when they leave who's going to sort of take up the mantle. So the first uh, important challenge is to institutionalize um, the approach. So an agreed approach forward and a dedicated officer charged with moving uh, these initiatives forward is really the first vital step uh, for us. And if we can even just achieve that in the next six months, I'll be very happy because at least I know when I leave um, that there is a, um, a whole group of people definitely dedicated to um, putting this into the college formally uh, and starting um, maybe that war gaming group uh, in the next uh, academic year, which starts in January 2022. So um, those are very humble goals, but um, sometimes incredibly difficult to uh, to achieve. But without that anchor, I think we will it will be lost. <laughs> so that's really the first, absolutely 100% thing that we need to achieve this year. So on that note, what are some of the obstacles in your, you mentioned them earlier a little bit, but what are some of the obstacles you see in terms of these goals, not only for this year, but also for the future development of this working initiative at ADC? I think we still have a lot to do uh, internally just to show, I think you got to show people, um, telling them about the utility of games is, is good, but I think you need to show them the utility. So even just some demonstrators uh, are important to to win over some of the people who aren't sure, you know, they kind of look at it as a frivolous um, endeavor because I guess they've never either a played games before or think um, think of Monopoly or something like that as a game. It's like, well, yeah, that has its own learning objectives, interestingly. But um, getting some of those people to and showing them through demonstration um, some of the utility of games is is probably uh, one of the more important ones. Um, the other one is resourcing, as I said, whether it's workforce, so you're getting that dedicated officer and then the budget um, at the college. Um, and I don't think it needs a huge budget for a modest beginning. Um, we've already bought a couple of 
games here at the college just to start, you know, showing people um, the link. And that, I guess that's where the strength of some of those informal afternoon sessions are intended to just demonstrate how games can be useful. Um, and then really it's, uh, it's really starting from there. And hopefully it's like trying to turn over a, a huge boulder uh, down a hill, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get it going. Um, but when you have actually started pushing and starting to move and then garnering that momentum. Um, so there's a lot of stuff at the college and I think part of it is running like a external facing um, events, perhaps um, hosted by the college, whether it's seminars and getting people like yourself and others online who have that experience to present virtually even um, at the start, talking about utility of games, um, and even just understanding probably the utility of play as an educational tool, as, um, as a bedrock is probably important. Um, there is so much literature out there, as I'm sure you, you know, uh, of how play can enhance learning and then leveraging off that academic material. So it's not just Joe making up, stuff up because she liked games, is actually a discipline academic study into how games, or sorry, how play is used and then how games are used um, for adult education. So as I wait for other people to hand in some last minute questions, um, but otherwise I think I would like to thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, thank you for sharing your time. I know your time zones can be tricky between Australia and the East Coast here in Washington, uh, but we really appreciate it. And here at Goose, we look forward to setting up game sessions and more collaboration in the future. So um, you know, I suspect that uh, we will continue to email and coordinate into the future. But otherwise, I don't see any other questions. So I would like to thank you again. Um, and if you have any last, uh, oh, we do have one last question that we ask all of our speakers this year, uh, which is mm -hmm. uh, if, you could, uh, if you could have any game designed, right? Either you design it or have someone else design it and you have unlimited funds and like no institutional you know, bureaucratic obstacles in your way, you just you know, magic wand, wave it and you got it, right? What would what game would you want designed or design yourself? Wow, that is a big question, man. Um, who, um, taking some inspiration, uh, I think from, from train is, uh, I think what we need to maybe develop is, and uh, leveraging off that is some, a game that looks at some of the strategic empathy, right? Like looking at, um, the other side of the hill, but at the grand strategy level, because I think um, some of the conflicts in recent times, um, and this is obviously up for argument, uh, is was lacking in strategic depth of what we were actually trying to achieve. So forcing um, people to confront, uh, to create a good strategy for um, any lever of national power, particularly the military one, because uh, you know you lose people and spend a lot of money. Um, is one that I would uh, definitely design. And that's at directed at the government level. Um, I don't know if there is gamification for, uh, you know, people, the civilian leadership, but I think that's one that I would probably look at us, ask, ask someone to design for me so they can actually play out what it looks like uh, to send people to war um, and the cost of that and really getting them uh, a in a confrontational way, same way that training is quite confronting so that they understand the weight of the, their decisions. That sounds like a great game. All right, thank you. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for their time and their great questions and have a good evening. Thanks, Sebastian. I might hang around real quick if you... <laughs>